seen is that you are a science writer. Um, you've written about mosquitoes for the New York Times. You've written about bunions for the Wall Street Journal. And now you're writing about asexuality. So give us a little bit of your bit background. I know that you grew up in China. Um, I know that you moved to California when, when you were five, but just give us some of your, your bit background. Right, absolutely. So my day job, I am a science and tech journalist. That is where my career aspirations, I suppose you would say, have always gone. I did a lot of stuff on AI, biotech, health. That Bunyan article was very long time ago. I think I was still an intern. And <laughs> You know, so people ask me, you know, why are you writing about asexuality? Because I'm not really a pop culture reporter. I'm not really a, a gender reporter or a sexual relationships reporter, although I enjoy learning about and reading it. And always for me, it was like, it felt necessary. You know, I identify as ace. And around the time when I was understanding what asexuality was, it felt like there were so few resources and that the resources that there were, you had to go looking for them. It wasn't something that you could just find the way you could find so many other types of resources, even in the area of sexual health or sexuality. And so there was a part of me that I think was always questioning, why is a science reporter writing this book that it's it's much more narrative, you know, it's a cultural studies book. It's not a science book, but mm -hmm. I, thought that it was important and hopefully that's been the case. Well, but also, I, I mean, not to um, not to underplay your part here, but the thing is, is that it is a very well-researched book and it is a very, a very well-written book. And it's also importantly, a very well-reasoned book in the sense that you lay these things out and what you just mentioned, and I've appreciated a lot in the book, is that pop culture does come out a lot in the, the, the book. There are present day, it's a 2020 book, but there are many present day references. So it was clear to me as I saw the book that there was an audience that you were trying to reach to, that you were trying to mix journalism and science and pop culture to reach a particular audience. Right. It really felt like there were two different audiences for the book. You know, one audience were people who already know about asexuality and identify as ace and who haven't had a reported book about asexuality before. This is the first one that has all of these stories from you know people's lives. And the other one is people who aren't ace, who are aloe, and but who I think would still gain something from the ace lens. You know, I think so much of the theme of the book isn't just this is what it's like to be ace, which is valuable in its own right, but it's also the ace lens is a way of looking at the world that I think can help people see it more clearly, just like the queer lens is a way of looking at the world that can help people see it more clearly. You know, even if you are straight, I think there's so much to gain by questioning heteronormativity. And I think that's kind of a parallel that we see when it comes to ace discussion. So let's back up a, a hair here to uh, uh, try to get our audience up to speed, because uh, for, speaking for, from myself, the terms ace and aloe were new terms to me. So define the, those terms for the audience. Right. So ace, asexual, it's someone who doesn't experience sexual attraction. And aloe is basically someone who's not ace. So if you're not ace, then you would be aloe. And I think the really tricky thing is that people, even people who've heard the term ace or the term asexual, they think they know what it means. Mm -hmm. I start off the book by talking about how I heard the term when I was 14 and I thought I knew what it meant, not experiencing sexual attraction. And it took 10 years and two relationships for that to be true because it really calls into question all these, all of these little discussions like what exactly is sexual attraction? And many people are asexual, but they are not sex repulsed. So there are people who are ace and they don't know it. They desire sex for emotional reasons, but because emotional reasons and physical reasons can be so closely interlinked, it can be really hard to separate out those threads. And so it's been interesting since I published the book, so many people have reached out and been like, I thought I knew what asexuality meant. I thought that I was an ace, but I've never seen it treated this way before, presented this way before. And now I'm questioning what if I am ace, which is interesting and gratifying to hear. Yeah, and of course, the, the relevancy to an LGBTQ community is the fact that we all get to make these decisions about our sexuality. And of course, that's one of the things which is really very powerful about what you bring out in the book. And 
I was I was looking at it through a particular lens in the sense is this book about gay people? Is it about straight people? And sort of where are where is the intersectionality between those? Between what Angela's saying here and what she's bringing out there, and I sort of found there were no bright lines between any of that stuff. And in, in a beautiful way, it was a very accepting way of other pe people out there. Yeah, and I think the book it centers ace people. And of course there are ace people who are gay. So they're romantically attracted to, you know, the same gender, even if they are asexual, there are ace people who are straight. There are ace people who are trans. So there's so many, you know, different intersections within the ace community. I think also when you're talking about ace community, ace discourse, there's so many other factors that you have to think about and you have to walk this fine line between arguing, you know, aces are valid. There's nothing wrong with being ace. And at the same time acknowledging, of course, you know, sex negativity exists. Of course, homophobia exists. You know, when people are always, not people. Sexism when, exists. Sexism yeah. exists, transphobia exists. So, you know, asexuality is valid, but the sexual control, you know, is so common that I think that those two strands um, can often intersect and make it hard for people to claim their own asexuality. You know, people always think, am I ace or am I repressed by the patriarchy? Am I ace or is this internalized homophobia or external homophobia? And all of those, and that can be hard to untangle. Yeah, no, that's that's a really good, good point. And and I guess the, the, the next thing that, that I th thought about with this is the fact and the similarities to how the LGBTQ community was treated by the medical establishment for many years, um, it, particularly in the 20th century up to about 1973 or 74, is that, um, and, I, and I'm probably guilty of this, of thinking of those who, def who self-define as ace as having some kind of disability, having there's something wrong with them and you very clearly lay it out that simply not, well, actually let's do this before, before I finish this question. Tell the audience what asexual means. It means not experiencing sexual attraction. And I think where you're kind of going is that there's often this question where, you know, is that a medical problem? Is that a psychological problem? And again, with the parallels in the DSM, which is what psychiatrists to diagnose people, there is an entry that essentially describes asexuality. And of course, we know that the, that doesn't necessarily mean anything, given the DSM also had homosexuality in it. And we of course know homosexuality is not a psychiatric disorder. Right. But so there's this question that people ask, you know, how do I know if I'm really asexual, if it's like this sexual orientation and it's normal and it's part of sexual diversity or if I have this disorder you know what's the dividing line between an identity and a disorder and for me I always think that it really is socially constructed so many people who identify as ace were once people who identified as aloe who were for example diagnosed with some kind of disorder who were maybe told to go to therapy or given hormones or some kind of other medical treatment and then how did they become ace? They decided there's nothing wrong with me. There is nothing inherently wrong with the way that I am, with not experiencing sexual attraction. This is who I am. This is not a disorder. So it really is, I think, very socially constructed. And one thing that I like about the ace community is that there's such a big focus on self-determination. You know, mm -hmm. when it comes to medicine, you go to the doctor and the doctor is an expert and they say, I'm going to diagnose you with X, Y, and Z. But with the ACE community, it's always like, you have the power to figure it out. You know, see if your experience resonates with that of other ACEs. Um, you get to explore. If you decide you're ACE now and you change, you know, sex, sexual fluidity exists. There's, so I think there's a real spaciousness and, um, focus on personal agency and autonomy that I really like and find attractive in the community. So did your research lead you to the idea that it was physical or it was cultural? I think that almost everything, and this is probably a science reporter talking, has like a biological component, has a you know, cultural component, has a psychological component. So I'm sure, you know, libido and desire, that's all true too. You know, I'm not saying that there's no effect of hormones or, or whatnot, but I will say that 
um, there are some distinctions that are important to make, which is that the lack of sexual attraction is not the same as, for example, erectile dysfunction. You know, they've done some studies and they've shown that, you know, typically ace men, they don't have any trouble having erections. So it's not like they need Viagra. Ace women, it's not an issue of sexual dysfunction. It's an issue of the amount of desire that you have. And one interesting thing that ACEs really focus on is that there is a difference between sex drive and sexual attraction, where sex drive is like libido. It's like wanting sexual release, right? And that can happen just spontaneously, whereas sexual attraction is that feeling toward a person. So there are ACEs who masturbate, for example, but that doesn't mean that, they, that that desire, that attraction extends to other people, which is an interesting distinction, I think, often gets alighted. Yeah, no, and I think it's a good point. And there's a, there is somebody you write about in the book whose name happens to be Hunter, that I think that he, he was, he's an ace, um, and, but he always felt insecure in, or, or dissatisfied because he wasn't happy sexually, even though he could, he could ejaculate, he could have sex with his wife. He, there were things that were going on, but once he accepted his own asexuality, he didn't feel like he was all arms and legs as he described that, that he felt that way in the book. It felt more n normal for, for him to be able to please his partner sexually. Right, exactly. You know, he said the problem was never that he hated sex. It's that, you know, he grew up in a religious environment, which I think most of us associate with, you know, purity culture, right? But he says that growing up, there was this message that, you know, even though sex is supposed to be, you know, monogamous and within marriage, like once you get there, it's supposed to be great. So what was wrong wasn't whatever the actual experience was. It was how different the experience was for him versus everyone telling him, you know, this is amazing. Why don't you love it? This is the center of life. You know, this is why you get married. So it was really that mismatch. There was nothing wrong with him. It was the messages he was receiving telling him that he should be focusing and caring so much about something that he turned out not to care about very much. Yeah, and 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 the thing that's the, the thing that's really beautiful about the way you've laid this out is the idea that ultimately he found a spot to feel it was okay for him to be able to understand that he was an ace. He could still enjoy sex, or he actually what I felt was that he actually enjoyed more the fact he was able to please his partner. Mm -hmm. He could perform sexually, having an erection and and having an orgasm was not a quick question for, for him. He could he could do that. But it was the fact it wasn't as as desirous to, to him, but he was able to please the partner who he, he was with. Yeah, and I think that what I would say is that it was, there's just different types of desire, right? There's right. so many reasons to have sex that are not because of physical desire. You know, people get bored or you feel insecure or you want to feel close to someone. All of those are desire too. It's just that physical spontaneous desire I think is often put in a different category. And for many people that seems like the real kind of desire, the, the primal, like the strongest kind. We really elevate that. And I think that's often what creates that dissonance for many people who either are ace or maybe aren't ace, but um, still feel that pressure. Yeah, yeah, and and also what's interesting is sort of looking at the, again how you've laid it out in the sense that you lay out the societal uh, norms and mores so that if a man is is not interested, so uh, let me say this d differently: if a man is having erectile dysfunction problems. He may, he may say to himself that he is asexual or his wife may, or his, or his husband may say he's, he's asexual, but, but the physiology is a completely different thing than who he is personally. And the same, and so, so the, the machismo that gets put on top of it, that men have to have erections and have to have, have to have uh, orgasms. And then also conversely, with, uh, with women in the sense that if they're not interested in sex, that somehow there's this frigidity. And I love the fact that you found that the word frigidity actually was first applied to men is really just an amazing thing. Yeah, it, I think there just really are so many expectations in so many parts of our lives, right? And I think all of us just live in surrounded by these social scripts and sexual scripts. And that it's not until you really on the outside, which many queer people are, which many ace people are, that you can start seeing them clearly and being like, 
oh, this is something that has limited me, but it doesn't have to. And even if you are someone who can, who is not ace and who can, has no trouble, you know, feeling sexual attraction, then maybe you would still be happier if you question all the assumptions you had about why you would have sex and the role of romance in your life and why is that centered and so on. Yeah, I mean, and of course, all those things are so important about why we have sex and why we have intimate relationships. I mean, there are there are certainly things about procreation that that is one, one path, and then there's physical enjoyment, um, and there there's so many uh, other paths that we take for for or, or acceptance that we go down those paths in order to to be able to have a physical attraction with someone else. Absolutely, it's. There's so many factors that go into it, but I do feel like we don't, we often don't have the language or the frameworks to think about it. You know, one of the chapters of the book, I talk about how aces separate, you know, romantic attraction from sexual attraction from aesthetic attraction. And I think that those are ideas that regardless of whether you're ace, can be interesting and illuminating to think about. You know, I think many people have talked about, you know, why they're attracted to, to a certain, you know, aesthetic type, even if they're not particularly, you know, sexually interested in them. Or oftentimes people will say to me like, oh, I have a friend that I felt like there was like something romantic there, but was it romantic because there was nothing sexual there? And then I'll say, you know, does romance have to include sex? What if romantic attraction could be different? So there's all of these concepts that I think are on offer that ACE discourse um, provides. And I think that having that makes it so much easier to think about the, the state of the world, because I think we are limited by language and we are limited by what we can Google. And if you don't know the keywords to Google, then there's so much you know, knowledge that is hard to access. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and that's a very good, good point about our romantic notions about, about that as well, too, because I think that's a large part of it. Well, you've promised to read a few things from, from the book. And one of the first things that we talked about was a chapter on um, page 171, called Anna. And if you have that close by, I would love to have you share this portion of, of the book with our audience. Yes, I would. So I want to talk a little bit about why I chose this. So the book has a lot of different reported stories from, you know, different types of aces. And this is actually the very last one. And I chose it because I feel like one asexuality um, is not new. You know, people who've identified as ace have been around for a very long time. The ACE movement is fairly new, and a lot of it was really tied to the internet. You know, the internet really brought people together, as is the case for many social movements, and gave it visibility. And that's great. But on the other hand, I think that what happens sometimes is that asexuality is denigrated as something that's, you know, about on the internet, something that's for young people, something that's not serious. And so Anna um, in this story is in her 50s. And I thought it would be interesting to talk a little bit about, you know, this illuminates her experience as someone who, oh, sorry, did you? Yeah, yeah, no, but, the, uh, um, but be, before you start reading it, it is a question that I just wanted to ask uh, because you just touched on it. It seemed to me from the research that you put out there that this point about this being a 21st century, the ACE phenomenon, if you want to call it that, being a, a, a web-based, internet-based um, 21st century, and really very at the very beginning of the 21st century, I think you make reference to either a, a Yahoo group or MySpace group yeah. or some of those, some of those very early groups uh, that were there. But Again, before you before you do this reading, just give our audience a little bit of context about what it was like that created this resurgence in in self identifying as ace and sort of help bring a community together. Right, absolutely. So to the first point, the idea that aces have always been around, I like to talk about Alfred Kinsey. You know, he created the Kinsey scale, and when he was doing those interviews, he came across people who we would today call as ace, people who did, essentially did not experience sexual attraction, but they just didn't really fit his data because his data was about, you know, bisexual, homosexual, heterosexual, and so he just marked them group X, and so really this group was just kind of ignored, 
And so then in the, you know, the early 2000s, people started coming together to discuss these topics. There was Haven for the Human Amoeba, which I think was a Yahoo listserv, again, which dates it Yahoo, who, who does those listservs now, and people congregated on that. Then there was AVEN, the Asexuality, Visibility, and Education Network, which began in, I believe, 2001, and that became kind of a flashpoint. There were also early communities, and I think it was there that people who had these experiences and would have had them probably regardless, were able to find other people who had the experiences and talk about what did it mean? You know, that's where having these discussions, what, defini what a definition of asexual. And if you are not celibate, can you still be asexual? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, and there's been a lot of activism around that, around the DSM, around representation, but really the internet did help facilitate that. And I think was responsible for, much of the early ace movement in the early 2000s. Yeah, I think that's an important point for people to realize that, again, exactly as you've said here, asexuals have been around since men and women have been around. But, and they've sort of come and gone, and we, we've touched a little bit on the fact that their role in society might have been most noted through the medical community, in which there would be an assumption that there was something wrong with somebody if they were asexual. I mean, that was the assumption. If you didn't want to have sex, what the hell was wrong with you? Yeah. And so, uh, but now what you've done is you've kind of taken it out of the closet as it were, and you've, you've, you've figured out a way or, 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 or the group has figured out a way to say, you know what, there's nothing wrong with us because yes, we can sexually perform, but we just don't have the same sexual desire that others in, in, in the same way that others do. Right. And I think that ACEs can really point out that oftentimes there's this, there's this pressure to perform. So people, even people who aren't ACE might feel that pressure. And I think we can agree that, you know, less pressure in general is a good thing. And it gives you more of an ability to figure out what you really want. And you're not spending so much time looking at what you're supposed to want or what other people think you want. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. So that was a, that was a, a, a di diversion from Anna. So uh, <laughs> uh, take a sip of water if you have one there, and then let's do what, uh, let's do a reading from Anna. All right. So I try to read a different selection each time. So I haven't read this one before. So let me know how I am on time because I can skip around a little bit if it gets you're to doing, me. You're doing just fine. So it's really, and, and I'm lo loving this conversation. So thank you for all of your openness here. So. Of course. So the chapter's called Anna. After 20 years and two kids, the marriage ended. Meredith had left. The boys, 11 and 15, were only around half the time now. Alone in her own space and with her own thoughts, Anna, though that wasn't her name yet, decided that she would do as she wished. Privacy was no longer a luxury. Finally, there was no one to answer to. First, Anna decided to dress how she wanted and for so long could not in skirts and dresses. Next, a trip to the doctor to say enough. The testosterone was not working. It did not increase her sex drive as it was supposed to and did not make her any more of the man that other people told her she needed to be. Anna asked whether she should try estrogen instead to balance everything out. Her doctor said that was an option. So Anna thought about it for a few months before coming back and saying yes. She started using the estrogen cream then stopped then started again. It was on and off, on and off again until one day she looked in the mirror and saw the beginnings of breaths. This was not an outcome that Anna had considered. The physical change had started up without her full awareness, but it was happening regardless and presenting a decision Anna would need to make. Reverse, continue. Changing nothing would mean making a choice as well, and Anna did not want to be passive this time. For most of her life, Anna didn't know what she wanted. Her family knew what she was supposed to want and told her. Her religious leaders knew and told her. The confident women she dated knew and told her. Anna listened. She looked around and noticed what others wanted and tried to imitate them. Many of us learn to desire by watching other people desire. We learn to desire George Clooney because People Magazine, he says he's the sexiest man alive. We want a beach body because of the constant marketing telling us that summer is only a few months away. In theory, mimetic desire can be perfectly fine. In practice, the world is not a neutral place. We are rarely surrounded by many types of people who represent many visions of life, free to pick the one that fits best. If you don't know who you are or what you want, the world will decide for you. It will show you a couple of options and tell you those are the only ones. It takes active work to step back, to create even enough space to take a breath and admit that maybe you don't know what you want. What has been offered has never felt right. Oh, I'm gonna skip forward a little bit. Anna was born in the 1960s in Utah, assigned male at birth. 
the granddaughter of a sheep ranch, sheep rancher. She had a proper Mormon family and was expected to be a proper Mormon boy. Instead, she was sensitive and anxious, the target of a father who would scrutinize her and then criticize her for crying. Mormon children were separated by sex from a young age, with the boys preparing for the eventual missions and going to Sunday meetings to learn to lead the woman and the family. Girls practiced for weddings and learned how to keep house. It was clear where Anna should fit, but by age four, she was already asking herself where she might want to fit. There was hardly a decision in her power to make. The rules of childhood turned into the rules of puberty, which felt even more like instructions that did not make sense. The series of changes that seemed to be happening to somebody else entirely. Anna knew that she was supposed to date, and she knew how to date. Get the car ready, pick someone up in the car, take her out to dinner, pretend to hesitate over the goodnight kiss. The steps were clear, but the motions did not feel meaningful. The car and date and kiss never seemed to bring Anna closer to the type of bond she wanted. Looking back, I can see that the girls were assuming that there was a sexual desire coming toward them from me that they had to protect themselves against, she says. No such urge in her existed, at least not for bodies and touching. For her classmates, the carefully choreographed moves may have helped them reach a wished for goal. Not so for Anna. She stopped dating altogether. Senior year of high school, Anna took a sociology class at a local college with a professor who's a bit of a perv. For the final assignment, the students were required to write about their personal fantasies of social deviance. Hoping to avoid the professor's voyeurism without failing the class, Anna decided to write about the deviant fantasy of celibacy. Her solution was clever, but it was not a lie. She did fantasize about a world without sexual intensity and sexual surveillance, where she didn't have to meet with bishops who asked whether she masturbated and questioned her about other sexual inclinations. The lascivious jokiness of, you know what you want, felt uncomfortable when she knew she didn't want it at all. A celibate life represented a form of freedom. Being a monk would be a dream, though Anna didn't exactly understand what a monk was since no such thing existed in Mormonism. Her project became simultaneously a, re a rebuke to the professor and a confession of being lost. She did not want what she was supposed to want. She had not copied others well enough. And it was not a proper Mormon man and she needed to get out. All right. Uh, and then she goes to Swarthmore. It's gonna skip that point. Uh, Ruth in California attached herself to Anna freshman year. Unafraid of being forceful and sure of what she wanted, Ruth was comfortable telling Anna how to have a relationship and comfortable telling Anna when it was time to have sex. That Anna was terrified didn't matter until it did. The first time Anna broke down. She left the room immediately and walked for hours in the neighborhoods around campus and beyond. The physical sensations had been overwhelming and they didn't connect to a place of wanting. That breakup was just for so many reasons, but the deepest place of it was, this didn't make sense to me, Anna says. I didn't understand this experience and I was doing something without an anchoring place in me that I wanted. I didn't feel a sense of self around sexuality and I went into a panic attack and I couldn't make sense of what was going on. The sensations were happening to her with no narrative, no structure or container that helped the bodily experience mean anything. The instructions were gone. The next part, I'll talk a little bit about how she meets her then wife, Meredith. Um, and Anna says, there was so much that was powerful and strong and good about the relationship. We really connected on a deep level. We fell hard for one another. And if it weren't for the sex part, we might still be together, honestly. But sex was a problem from the beginning, apparent even early on. Once, Meredith had said that everything, no matter what, was actually about sex. Anna was shocked. What are you talking about? She said, no, it's not. Meredith was shocked in return, and she asked Anna what she meant and how she could not see that sex was everywhere. To her, the presence suffused the world. It was a vital energy that helped everything else make sense. To Anna, nothing was about sex. As a therapist, she was intellectually interested in it. She enjoyed talking about it. But personally, she did not feel the presence anywhere at all. This gap in experience became more and more clear. Over time, Anna stopped being able to pretend. Pleasing Meredith was great, but she could not generate desire for its own sake. I struggled with that a lot because I was still trying to manufacture it, and it was woven into masculinity and gender, she says. I was trying to create the masculine sexual self that I thought I was supposed to be. I could have sex, but she didn't feel me desiring her, and that was a place of deep identity. Couple therapy, individual therapy. The therapist supported Anna taking testosterone and told her to work harder to rise to the level of the desire of the other person, even though Anne had spent her entire life doing that and had experienced so much direct pain and harm from it. The two decided to try an open relationship, but Meredith became afraid when Anna began dating a close friend and Anna realized that she was not free to do what she truly wanted, which wasn't to have recreational sex, but to love other people. 
Soon, they were sleeping in separate rooms. Finally, Anna, looking through the mail one day, found a notice about a new bank account Meredith had opened. She thought, oh my God, what is happening? Meredith said, I don't want to be in this relationship anymore. It's the last part. I would have stayed in it, says Anna. I don't like saying that about myself, but I would have. That's just how I'm wired. I would have kept paying the cost I was paying in order to keep things together. But Meredith didn't stay. After, after the divorce, in the middle of crisis, Anna began searching for answers online. Was she bi gender? Was that a thing? Was that even a real word? What did the low sexual desire mean about her? During one of these searches, she found Avon, that's the Asexuality Visibility Education Network, and read and wept. It was like, oh, this shifts from this weird thing in my experience, a way that I'm weird and broken in the world, to thinking this might be something I can share with other people in a constructive way, she says. There was this sorrow that I had to be alone all this time without having this name, this identity, this community. There was a sense of loss woven into it. Finding asexuality was all mixed together with exploring gender. Anna began wearing skirts in the house, started taking estrogen. She looked in the mirror and saw the beginnings of breasts and made the decision to move forward, to ask for the full dose of estrogen and go, this is who I am. The divorce turned out to be the push that she needed and self-discovery was its unexpected gift. Maybe Anna could have come out of the divorce. Maybe she could have asserted a new identity from within her marriage. She doubts it. It has taken a lifetime to reach this place. In Utah, a half century ago, nobody seemed to be ace or trans. All those years of struggle were experienced long before Anna knew about the option to transition before there was Avon. So many of these questions have been around for so long. Now, at this different stage of life, Anna's concerns are different in some ways from those of younger aces, but similar in that she too is still figuring out how romance and love and sex and self fit. She has stepped back from what the world chose for her, even when that leaves her in uncomfortable, unpioneered territory. I'm still so puzzled. I have so many big questions, she says, including questions about her new body and how it might affect her desire. As she started transitioning, everyone said her asexuality would change once she was further in the process and once she had surgery. People really want me to find a path to sexuality and they try to leverage my gender identity in the service of that goal, she says. Without a place for asexuality in the culture, those who love her were distressed about her asexuality in the way that they never were about her being trans. I really stayed open to that, Anna adds, and I still kind of try because I want aspects of that, but no, it's all pretty much still where it was. Romantic or uh, aromantic, none of that is figured out either. I cannot figure that out, Anna tells me, but also I'm more and more okay with not knowing and not forcing herself to figure it out. There's not a known structure, but I've spent my whole life letting other people define those structures and trying to fit into what they experience the structure of a relationship to be. It's better to accept the questions without demanding answers, to exist in the open-ended lived experience of the moment, one where she can just be. So that was the first election. <laughs> well, it is such an incredibly powerful story. Um, and um, you were so lucky. How, how did you meet Anna? I, you know, off the top of my head, I can't remember. I definitely met her online. You yeah. know, to this day, we haven't met in person. We've spoken a lot on the phone and we keep joking after the pandemic, we'll meet up and have a drink. Um, but definitely, I think it was probably through a friend of a friend online, but I can't quite remember. What, what I found so powerful when I read that story what was, or that experience, was simply how there was an individual who was searching and trying to find uh, the personal experience that would make them whole and make them full. And there were all of these other things about gender and sexuality and, and how much sex you, you, you have that had gotten into that individual's way. And that there was an opportunity, they, they found an opportunity to find a path and how powerful it was for them to find that path. Right, absolutely. And I think it really speaks to how important, you know, all the activism that's happened since Anna was a child is, you know, like she said, when she was growing up, you know, she, even from the age of four, she was starting to question her gender identity. You know, she, as a, as a teen, she probably today would have had a much easier time recognizing herself as ace. And so I think it's so important that now it's hopefully much easier for many people to acknowledge that. I also think, um, What's interesting about the book as well, too, is that you, you, you use the opportunity of being asexual to create a sexual book. 
And, and it, there's a lot of discussion about sex in this book. And I don't think you can talk about asexuality without talking about sexuality. And so you mix the, it's like, it's like you can't talk about light without talking about dark or, or, nay, or, or night without talking about day. It's not that either one is better than the other, but you have to have something, you have to have, to have some context to put this into. Absolutely. And, you know, people when I'm interviewed sometimes will say like, oh, do you think that, you know, the ace community's past sexuality, whatever that means. First of all, I don't know what that means. But second of all, no, because we're still defining ourselves as not experiencing some elements of sexuality, right? I think that the ace community in many ways is a reaction to sexual pressure that exists, again, with the acknowledgement that, you know, sex negativity is also there. And also the fact that for many people, if you don't experience sexual attraction, you're just seen as as broken. One person I interviewed had this great quote where she said something like, you know, I, if I had it my way, my life would not involve a lot of talking about asexuality. I'm not a non-crafter. It's just that, you know, no one ever asks me, why don't you love crafts? The only reason I'm vocal about my asexuality, I'm an asexual activist, is because people have a problem with it. Yeah. Yes. And, and that is something which is very important. I mean, particularly for those of us in the LGBTQ community, you know, sometimes I wonder why I spend so much time talking about being gay. Well, it's only because there's a certain segment of the population that and culture that's been around for two, three, five thousand years that actually makes this a topic of conversation. Imagine if it weren't. Heterosexuality is not a it's not a topic of conversation. Exactly, I I totally feel that, and you know, a lot of times aces will say we just we just want to stop being asked why we don't do something, you know, like I, I wanted to be neutral in the same way that, you know, heterosexuality is neutral instead of always be asked to justify or, you know, are you really this or did something cause you to be this, you know, there really is such a double standard. And, and again, that's the bias within this whole story, which is the idea that there must be some defect. There has to be a problem there. And, and that, and that, that it's something that we have to fix, which again, to me, sounds like white male patriarchy that wants to somehow come in and control to be able to make something happen like that. That if you don't, if you don't follow what I want, then there's got to be something wrong with you. Right. And, you know, I keep talking about the complicated kind of social dynamics because you do have that have to walk that line because, of course, for instance, you know, women are shamed and there's a sexual double, st double standard for women. So, of course, I think in many cases it is true that women aren't able to explore their sexualities and in that way that they are repressed. But at the same time, that doesn't mean every woman, you know, that's the case for every woman. Some women just are ace or some women just have low desire and low libido. So there's always that line where, you know, at the same time, you know, I think there's this long history of white people trying to control the sexualities of people of color. You have to walk that line and see what is that people expect of me? You know, why is that? What's the power, what are the power dynamics working here? But also at the end of the day, if I'm ace, that's totally fine too. And I shouldn't have to spend all my life worrying that I'm not and that it's conditional in some way. Just a reminder everybody, I'm Hunter O'Hanian. I'm the director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archives. And my guest tonight is Angela Chen. And we're talking about her book, Ace, uh, what, uh, what Asexuality Reveals About Desire, Society, and the Me Meaning of Sex. And so if you've not bought it, please uh, run out to your local book bookstore and get, get a copy of it. Um, and uh, again, this talk is being recorded. And if you have questions, now's a good time to throw them into the chat. You can do that either on Facebook or you can do it on the Zoom link that we have right now. And hello to all of our friends out there on Facebook. And we'll take those questions up as they come. Um, so switching gears a little, little bit here we talked about you Angela, a little bit in the bit beginning and your bit background and uh, but but also um what i found very intriguing about this is that as a journalist and a science writer this book is very much a personal journey for you and there's a lot about you in this book so how so why um, how did it feel? Um, how does it feel today um, having it out there? Um, give the audience some of Angela's uh, story. Yeah, I think the why is that I always knew that 
it's important to me that a book about the ace community be written by the ace community you know like i think in general it's good for people from the community to be the ones telling that story and speaking for ourselves and i thought that if that were to be the case then i think it would be good to include my perspective because it would make me sort of a guide for the reader as they go through and another reason is because my ace identity and the way that it is expressed is a little different from the kind of more typical ace narrative. So, you know, asexuality has been around, you know, it's been in the media, you know, off and on for the past 20 years, but it was always the same kind of story. It was always someone being like, I always knew I was different. I knew that I was not attracted. I knew I didn't, you know, t sexually, I knew that I didn't experience sexual attraction. I'm repulsed by sex. And all of that is totally valid and important. But my experience and a lot of the experiences of people who are ace was that we didn't realize we were ace for a very long time. We're not celibate, we might have partners and we're still ace. And I think that presenting that narrative and showing how broad asexuality can be can help other people who maybe their experience is a little bit closer to my end of the spectrum. So I think that's another reason. Um, in the months since the months since I published the book, I've gotten a lot of feedback and a lot of people have said, um, I liked your memoir parts because I think they were very relatable. At the same time, other people have said it was not relatable, which is totally fair. You know, everyone has their own different experience, their own priorities. But, you know, I will say that it was hard for me to be open because I think that when there's stigma and I think asexuality is still stigmatized, then of course, most people want to always present themselves in the best way, right? And throughout the book, I talk about times where, you know, I felt unhappy about being ace, which sometimes felt like a betrayal of being an ace person, or I talked about times that I had judgmental thoughts about aces or about asexuality. And those are not exactly the kind of things I'm proud of. But I think that many of I think they didn't come from they didn't come from nowhere, right? Like the fear and the stigma came from the outside. And I think presenting them, I hopefully made me a more honest guide, and hopefully for others who may have had the same thoughts, was reassuring. I, I, that's a be beautiful answer, and it's really great. Have you thought about what it will be like uh, when you're fifty and you look back on this on this dusty dusty moldy copy of this book? When you wrote it, did you think about did you think about how you would reflect on it later in life? I thought about it from more of a community perspective. You know, my dream is that when I'm 50, all the things that I talk about in the book and the things that make being a stigmatized and the things that make, the things that make being a difficult are just gone. And so I hope my dream is always that when I'm 50, people will be reading it and being like, wow, you know, she complains so much and look at all the progress that we've made. I don't think I'd spend a lot of time thinking about how I personally would look at it. I mean, the truth is I'm someone who is embarrassed by everything I do. So I'm pretty, you know, I'm just, it's just, I could be perfect and I would find something embarrassing about it. And so I'm sure that when I'm 50, I'll look back at it with embarrassment the same way that I now look back at my blog post from when I was 15 with embarrassment. So I think that's a fair bet to make knowing my own personality. And 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 you can blame part of that on your very loving and guiding parents that you had as well too. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they I bet they were good guides in, in that whole process for you. Um, so let's talk a little bit about about ACE and the LGBTQ community and intersectionality there and sort of queerness because again you know that those are when you think about you know the world as Venn diagrams and these different ideas and you think about queerness and you think about LGBTQ and then we put we put ace on top of that whole thing um, and we think about intersectionality a lot we talk about that a lot in the LGBTQ community between race and gender and and, and um, sexual orientation add ace into that mix, into that stew of those of us that swim within the non-heteronormative world out there. Mix that up a little, little bit for us. Yeah, to me, aces are queer. You know, I think the A in LGBTQIA stands for asexual. I think that's on my jacket copy. I think though that within the community, the larger queer LGBT community, that's a discussion that's still happening, you know, because I think that the experiences and the difficulties and the ways of relating um, are different. And 
I think there's this question, you know, and I think that aces have this privilege of being invisible in many ways, you know, many ways, usually, of course, you know, there are aces, like I said, who are gay or trans, but if you are a heteromantic ace, then essentially you pass as a straight allo person. But I think that the reason I, I think that aces are queer is because even if you are asexual and heteromantic, you're still not heterosexual. You know, I think you're, even if you're hetero, you're not heterosexual and sexual and compulsory sexuality and sexual pressure is all still there. You know, the first long story in the book is about Hunter, who as you mentioned, who grew up religious and he is only attracted to women. So he's not, you know, so he doesn't feel homophobia, but he still felt so much shame and so much confusion because of compulsory sexuality. So I definitely think that aces are queer. And I think that increasingly, um, that is accepted and that is discussed. But I also understand that the perspectives are different and I hope that it can, I hope that we can all be together standing against heteronormativity. You know, I'm not against heterosexuality, I'm against heteronormativity. Yeah, I, and I think I, I absolutely agree. You know, it's funny working in a n number of these LGBTQ organizations and people argue about, you know, is it gay, is it LGBTQ, is it queer? And a while ago, I said we should just call. I was working at the Leslie Lohman Museum uh, in New York at the time, and I just said, you know, let's just call it the Museum of uh, of um, uh, hetero unnormative behavior, and just leave it alone because you know it really is that sort of big bucket that all these people fit in. There is the there is the um, there is the the perfection that we've all been taught particularly by Western civilization and by Western mores out there. And, um, and then there's everybody else. And so we, we, have, to, we have to find that, those things as we go. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think there's a, a long ways to go with the ACE movement. You know, I think that a lot of people still don't really understand how broad asexuality is, how it can be expressed in so many ways. I think that, and I also think that when it comes to representation, because we start out this discussion talking about pop culture and, you know, um, asexual and popular culture, I would one day love to see representations of asexuality that aren't about the identity. You know, it's like, you don't, like, I don't want to see a character who's, whose entire arc is that they are a Chinese person. You know, I don't want to see a character whose entire arc, like my, my personality is not being ace. And so that's another dream I have. Sure. I mean, I want someone to say, I'm a painter, I'm a writer, I'm smart, I'm mean, I'm funny. And oh, by the way, he's gay. You know, right. you, you don't want to be defined. In I, and actually, you know, what, what happens now, and I don't object to it, but you know, I can get tagged at time for being, for having the privilege of being white and being male. And so, you know, we don't want the negative or the positive of those things uh, for them. One thing we didn't touch on, although you mentioned it a little bit with Hunter, but it made me think about with asexuality, um, the role of the Catholic Church and the deep-seated tradition within the Catholic Church of living a celibate life and of, of monks who were, and monks and and nuns and priests for, for centuries and centuries and centuries that, uh, and even to this present day, of course, that are advised to be, or, or they have to take vows of celibacy um, that by, by kind of our definition, maybe they're not asexual, but, but uh, they're not aces, but they choose to live an ace life. Is that fair? Um, and, 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 and so, um, Talk about, talk about, and particularly I'm interested in the role of the Catholic Church in, in propelling that, that idea into culture. I don't know if I would say they live an ace life. And I think this has to do with definition, right? Because they are celibate, they're not having sex. So you could say in a literal way, they're living an asexual life. But I think aces really separate, you know, the behavior, which is celibacy and the attraction. So many people can be celibate and be allosexual and always be thinking about sexuality and always be relating to things in a sexual manner. And so in that way, even if you are celibate, I don't think you'd be living an ace life. You know, when people like, because asexuality can be so broad, people sometimes be like, so like, how can you be ace if you're not celibate? And for me, it's not about 
how much sex you have. It's about a way of seeing the world, you know, like do you center sexuality and how you engage with others and how you relate to others. But it is interesting to think about the role of celibacy because I think that when we think about celibate monks, we pretty much assume that they're all allo. We pretty much assume that there's something that they're repressing or denying or, you know, pushing away their own sexual attraction to others. And although I'm sure that throughout history, there have been ace monks and you know, ace nuns and such. So it is interesting to think about that role. Um, I don't know how I feel about the vows of celibacy. So I'm not Catholic and I'm certainly not an expert in religious tradition, but I have personally always, and, and you know, of course I can respect if someone wants to make that vow because it makes them feel closer to God. But I personally always think, you know, is that too tough on people? <laughs> is that, you know, is that, and of course we've seen the sex scandals in the Catholic church. So maybe the answer to that can be yes. Yeah, no, there's no question, of course, that there are definitely allos within the Catholic church, within the priesthood. And, and, and that's been going on for, for years. For some reason, I'm thinking, you know, going back to like, 15th and 16th century in, in Italy in the Catholic Church and these monks and where, you know, they, they just, they, like, they would just have to beat sex out of their lives, you know, and so the idea was to lead an asexual life, that, that sexuality, because they, they couldn't procreate and there was, there was no reason to have sex but for procreation. And again, you know, we see that t- today. I mean, those are some of the values that we see today with congressional candidates uh, talking about Q- QAnon. I mean, we saw it with Anita Bryant about save our children. It's all about morality. Sex is so tied up in, in what morality for a lot of these people. But it, it's it's curious to, to me to think about sort of the the arc of this movement and actually how the, how what you're talking about in such a positive way has actually been used as a weapon against certain people that you know they could they could get salvation in heaven if they if they turn themselves into aces as it were and yeah. whether they were allos and that's an amazing tra- trade off i mean what bit better than than eternal salvation if you move yourself from one side of the scale to, to the other yeah and i think it is true that you know, this has been weaponized and in more than just the Catholic religious um, context, you know, the group that I'm thinking of is people who are disabled and oftentimes they are perceived by the world to be asexual regardless of whether they, whatever they actually are. You know, many disabled people are allo and if you know about the disabled community, there's a lot of efforts to fight the idea that they're asexual. And so, you know, asexuality has in some ways been thrust and forced upon them without their without their will, without their consent. So, I mean, sexuality and sex is so symbolic and yeah. it's symbolic in, you know, sin and, you know, everything negative, but then it's also in some way symbolic in good ways. You, you know, if you're a woman and you have a lot of sex, you can be liberated and passionate. And so I think it's not that I want to strip the symbolism from sexuality, but I think it'd be interesting to play around with all the symbolism that's been there and switch the lenses and think about what else it can mean. Yeah, and that's true. And also, I just want to uh, give you kudos as well, because I think that how you brought out members of um, the disabled community in, in the book and, and spoke to, to them as well, I think is very powerful. And so congratulations on that. We're just about out of time. We only have a minute left. But so here's my last quick question for you. So on the cover of your book, it says ACE. What asexuality reveals about desire, society, and the meaning of sex. So what does asexuality reveal about desire, society, and the meaning of sex? So much that I don't know if I could say it in a minute, but just, you know, one thing that I said that sex is so symbolic at level. I mean, we all know that, right? But it's symbolic at levels that we don't know. I think it makes us question the definition of what sex is, what sexual attraction is, what sexual desire is, what sexuality is. I think it can reveal that our culture really elevates romantic relationships in a way that, you know, and simultaneously devalues friendships in a way that I think um, would be good if it were dismantled. I think it can teach us so much about consent and it can teach us so much about identity and the intersection of health. So yeah, those are just quick things off the top of my head. (laughs) Well, it's great. And, and for those of you who have not gotten the book yet, please um, put it as a uh, request in your uh, stocking uh, because it would be a great addition 
and to have. Um, Angela, it's been amazing to chat with you. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been great to have this good conversation. Um, and uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it and great to have you here. I hope that if you come to South Florida, that you'll stop by uh, the Stonewall National Archives and M Museum in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And for those of you, if you're not signed up for our newsletter, you can go to stonewall-museum.org and we'll send you um, a notices about all these talks. As I said, this is probably episode 30 of these and uh, we are scheduled right now through June, uh, which is just amazing. So many people wanna be part of, of these talks, which is great. We're not going to do a talk next week, um, but the week after, um, we will be doing a taped interview, which I did last week, um, of the Tom of Finland exhibition at the Gallery Jardin in Berlin. And our guide will be Misha Gronowski, who is the former creative director for Bruno Gramunder Books. And so we had to uh, tape that one in advance simply because of the time difference between here and Berlin, but because of the, of the pandemic, um, many people were not able to see uh, that particular exhibition. So we're very happy to bring that. And also what's interesting, um, Angela, that you know we were talking about hyper, hyper sexual role models out there and versus uh, aces out there. And of course, Tom of Finland might be as much of an LO out, out there as there possibly is with a lot of those, uh, a lot of those images. But that will be in two weeks. I'd like to do a shout out to Emery Grant. Emery, you back there feeling a little bit under the weather. And so there he is. Thank you, Emery. Thank you for your help. Angela, nice to see you. As I said, I hope you have um, a safe and happy holiday. And we'll see everybody in two weeks. So long. Thank you so much. Bye.